have with us in the gospel tonight are Brother Samuel McKinley from the Fairview Assembly in Vancouver, who has already opened. And then following him will be our Brother Jack Zhang from the Victoria Drive Assembly, also in Vancouver. And thank you to our brethren for making the, the trip down to Abbotsford to help us in the gospel. The reason we do this is because we have a wonderful message to tell. And we would love, if you're not saved tonight, that this will be a night uh, when you trust the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. Remember that uh, this week in this hall at uh, 7.30 Wednesday evening, we have our prayer meeting and Bible study in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. And you're welcome to that. And then uh, next Lord's Day is today, 10 a.m., the breaking of bread and Sunday school at 11.45, as is the Bible class, we now call it from Sunday school. It's been re relabeled as Bible hour, but anyway, we all know what that is. And uh, next Lord's Day is today at 7 p.m. The gospel is, is preached. Now, next Lord's Day, we do have our brother Joy Muring Gathery, who is from India. He will be with us on Sunday, the 23rd of October, and he'll be with us throughout the week at 7.30 p.m. for ministry, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evening. And I should mention that uh, our brother is in Victoria Drive uh, this week at 7.30, each, each night all the way to Friday evening. So if you would like to uh, attend there, or I'm sure you could log on with Zoom, uh, that's an option as well. So all these meetings are uh, announced in the will of the Lord, and we'll just turn it over to Sam. Again, thank you very much for coming. You know, this <clears throat> hour that we'll spend together tonight, we're going to deal with the most important things in life and the most important decision that we can make in life. And this hour is not just spent out of tradition or habit, but we would implore with you to pay your utmost attention to the word of God and not to our voices necessarily, but to the voice of God as he speaks through his word. These things are about eternity, the afterlife, where we will be for all eternity, where our souls will be. The Bible tells us there's a real place called heaven, and there's a real place called hell. And there's only one of two places. And so this is what we're dealing with. This is about your soul, where you will spend eternity. And so with that, we're going to read first in Mark chapter 1. And verse 15, these are the words of the Lord Jesus. Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. Actually, we'll just um, read it. Verse 14. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So here we have the Lord Jesus. Him, he's preaching. And this is what the Lord Jesus is saying. He's declaring, he's saying, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He came down from heaven and this is what he preached when he was here. This is what he went around the countryside declaring, repent ye and believe the gospel. And this isn't just for the people of that day. This is, applies right to you and me today. Repent ye and believe the gospel. It says right there after the word repent, ye, you. It's a very personal message, the gospel. Repent, you, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now what's all entailed in this? Well, repenting. That's turning from oneself. You see, maybe we should talk about what we need to repent from. You see, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. That includes each one here. We've sinned. We've sinned. We've come short of the glory of God. And, and our sin is going to take us away from God. And we need to repent from that. We need to repent we're going the wrong way. We need to do a 180 degree turn and realize that 
Our sins are taking us to a lost eternity, and we need a Savior. We need, some, we need salvation, or else we will perish. So the Lord Jesus is saying, repent, turn, admit you need me, you need someone, repent, turn from your ways, the way you're going, you're going down to a lost eternity, turn, repent, and believe the gospel, believe the gospel, that's the good news, and it must have been quite something to be hearing it from the Lord Jesus himself, for he was the good news, he was the good news in flesh, and while he isn't here in person today, he's, he's, we, the gospel, the good news that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So to save the lost ones, to save us, the sinners, the ones who are going to perish in a lost eternity, just believe the gospel that I came to die for you. Except it's a worthy, it's a faithful saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What a truth. Sinners. That's, that's who we and me are. But, you know, first of all, we need to admit that we're sinners. We need to be a time in our life when we admit there's nothing good in me. My sin is worthy of eternal judgment, eternal death. But that's when you, when you can see, when you can turn, that you need a savior. You need saving from your sin. And you can see that the truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so here the Lord Jesus is declaring, repent ye and believe the gospel. And it's the same message that we're declaring over 2,000 years later. You need to repent and believe the gospel. What are the consequences for not repenting? We'll just quickly go to Luke 13. And then we'll go to where we might spend more of our time. Luke 13, and this is, a, this is a teaching, again, from the Lord Jesus. These are words that he said on this earth, and we can trust them. And I'm just going to just pull out two verses here. We're not going to go through the story. Verse 3 of chapter 13 is the Lord Jesus speaking. He says, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What does it say in verse 5? Again, the Lord Jesus is emphasizing this truth. Nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Here in this this uh, time when he was teaching, he was telling of people who perished. But friend, this is real to us tonight. We were talking about the, necess the necessity to repent and believe the gospel. And this is the warning that the Lord Jesus has given. And except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There's a real hell for sin. There's a real hell where the, any who have not trusted Christ, who have not had a time in their life when they believe the gospel, will be in for all eternity. You know, this lifetime is just a fraction of what the forever and ever will be. There's one of two places. And the Lord Jesus, in love, he's warning, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. There needs to be a time in your life when you repent, or you will perish. We have to come to grips with this fact. It's not something that we like to think about, but we need to prepare it, and it says, except you repent, you have to repent now in lifetime. After life is over, after our little life is over, it's too late to repent. It's too late to turn. He's given us lots of time in lifetime. He's given us tonight by the kindness of God. He's given us tonight to repent and believe the gospel. We shall all perish. What an awful thing to be under the sound of the word of God, to have the truth of the word of God. And to go out and to perish when you could have repented and believed the gospel. There has to be a time in your life when you make this personal. And that should be tonight. Because there's, we have no guarantee of tomorrow. Do you know, I would just like to go to Luke 6. And this is, again, words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's teaching a lesson. These are, he's, he's speaking of people who have heard his words on this earth. What were his words? I've said them many times and I might say them more, but we want us to get this in our heads. Repent. Unless you repent, you shall likewise perish and repent and believe the gospel. These are his sayings. Repent and believe the gospel. So we're going to read this story and then we're going to go through it a couple times. We're going to see the analogy the Lord Jesus is using and then how it applies to us spiritually. So verse 46, he says, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. 
Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the earth did beat, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. These are, again, these, just to clarify, these are, if you have a Bible where the words of the Lord Jesus are in red, this is, again, words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can trust these words. He's giving a, a solemn warning and going over truths that you will relate to, which we already spoke of. And so I just want to go through this and, and just make sure we understand the analogy the Lord Jesus is using and, uh, and everyday uh, things that would happen in the, in the world. And so he's saying that there's one man here, he built a house and he dig deep and he laid a foundation on a rock. So this is a man that's going, he's going to build a house. And before he built the house, the part that we see, he built a foundation. You know, there could be two houses that people build and a, and a house, when we think of a house, we think of what we see above the ground level. We see grass or a driveway, and then we see the house. And generally we, we think of that as the house. And oftentimes we don't really think that there's a foundation that that house is built on. And so the Lord Jesus is saying, there's one man, he built his house, but first before he built the house, he dug deep. He got through the soil, which compacts and moves and washes around and erodes. He, he dug all that out and he went right down to solid rock, solid rock, something that's firm, that cannot move, unlike the loose soil on top. And then there, that's where he laid a foundation for his house. So he went down and he did the hard work before building the house that we live in and see. And you know, I was thinking a foundation, you know, it's an extra cost to, to build a foundation, you know, in our, in our world's uh, standards, if you were to, you know, just all the, the concrete and the excavating that has to go into, you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars to put a foundation on a house, but it, it costs something, but it's doing it right. And so this man, this first man, the Lord Jesus is saying, he built a house. First of all, he excavated, he dug down deep. And he laid a foundation on something solid. So then he, he built his house on something solid, something that couldn't be moved, something that couldn't be washed away. And that was the base of his house. And then he says, the Lord Jesus is teaching. So when the rains came and the floods arose and the stream, it beat vehemently. This is not just a little stream going down the, the street. Vehemently is an intense word, something that just thrust itself at it like it makes you think of a rush rushing river or something like that on the stream it, it beat hard upon the house but you know it couldn't shake the house it couldn't even shake it because the house was built on a rock it says it was founded upon the rock he had a foundation to that house that house stayed but then the lord jesus says there's another man he built a house as well but he built it without a foundation he skipped all the expense he didn't take the time and he just went from the ground up you know, if these two men, if they were to have their two houses side by side, you know, to the casual observer, two houses on top of the ground, you might not have been able to tell one had a foundation and one didn't. The foundation is what's unseen, but it's what's important because without the foundation, the house can fall. And so here we see the same thing that happened to the first house. The floods arose, the stream beat vehemently, intensely upon that house. What does it say? Immediately it fell, immediately it fell. And it says the ruin of that house was great. So, you know, the Lord Jesus wasn't warning about how to build your house, but he was using this as an example. And I hope that we sort of understand what he's saying is in the physical uh, example. And now we're going to try and go through and draw some spiritual lessons from this and what the Lord Jesus is really trying to get at here. So first of all, in verse 47, he says, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my saints, whosoever. 
You know, we sung that hymn to start, whosoever will may come. So whosoever is the you and you and me, whosoever, each one of us. And each one of us in this meeting tonight, we are going, we're like either of these men. There's only two options. We've already thought about heaven or hell, just like there's those two options. There's two options here. And we're either going to be like the first man or the second man. So whosoever, that includes all of us, the two men were likened to either to you and me. But then it says, whosoever cometh and heareth my sayings. Heareth my sayings. That's hearing the gospel. So what were the Lord Jesus' sayings? We already talked about. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And so those were his sayings. Whosoever heareth my sayings. Both men, it says they heard. So birth, both men were presented with the gospel. Both men heard the warning. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay, so these are two men that are familiar with the good news, the gospel, the warning that they need to repent. So what's the first man? He hears the saints. He hears the truths from the mouth of the Lord Jesus, and he does them. He takes heed to them. That's like tonight. If you take heed to the message of the gospel, to repent and believe the gospel, he takes heed to them. So he says, here, I'll show you to whom he is like, the one who, who does them. And he's like the man he was which built a house and dig deep. I just want to think about that word house, applying this to us. Our, the house in this uh, analogy here is a picture of our lives. Each of us have a life to build. Each of us have a free will. God does not force us into anything. We're each, we each one of us are building a house, just like these two men. And so your house is your life. And the decisions that are made right at the very beginning of your life, right beginning as you're starting to build your house, they will impact the end result of your house. And so the, our house, as we look through this, our house is your life. But the first man, he was going to build his house. He's building his life. And what does he do first? He digs deep and he lays the foundation on a rock. The foundation. We're thinking about that foundation. That's the base of a house. And we're thinking of the cost of it. We're thinking of how it's what's unseen. And you know, that really applies to salvation. What, whether we're saved or not, is something that's between us and God. It's, there will be out, there will be fruits and there will be things that other people see. But generally, to the casual observer, they see two houses standing, two people side by side. One person might have that foundation under them. One, one person might have that eternal life that salvation and the other person might not. And so here's a person. And first of all, he, he's taking care of the things that are unseen. He's not going after necessarily, you know, he's not going straight up with the house. The other man, he skipped the foundation and he just started building the house. And, you know, we can do that too. We can worry more about our school and our work and our business and our bank accounts and our cars or whatever it might be in our life. But it's important to take care of that which is unseen, like in the quietness of your room when no one else is seen, no one else is looking, no one else is cheering you on, to be alone with the word of God and taking care of that which really matters, that which is unseen. And so thinking about that just in relation to the foundation, it's that which might be unseen in our lives, that quiet moment when we trust Christ in the, in, in the quietness of our rooms or wherever, in the quietness of your heart in the meeting tonight. It's something that is unseen to the casual observer. But then he laid the foundation. He didn't just lay it anywhere. He laid it on a rock. You know what the rock, I don't think I even need to say what the rock speaks of. The rock speaks of Christ. And that's why we sang that second hymn, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. The solid rock. So his house he built it on a rock. He built it on Christ. And you know, that's just like our lives. If we're going to stand, if we're going to have a house that stands, we have to build it on a rock. We have to trust in Christ because we have to have that foundation because to have a house without a foundation, we all know that how that's going to end. We'll find out about it here in a moment. But you need to have that foundation. You need to lay that foundation. That house needs to be built on Christ. And so... The test came, the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and it couldn't shake it, for it was founded upon 
a rock. You know, our sins, there's judgment for sin. Romans 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So there's wages for sin. You know, if we don't, if our house isn't built on the rock, if our life does not have Christ in it, if we've never had a moment in our life when we've trusted Christ as our own personal savior, we don't have that rock, then we will have to pay the wages for our sin. But you know, if we're like this man and we've built our, our, our house on Christ, our life on Christ, when the, when the floods come, when the, the, the judgment that should be come against us, it won't shake us because Christ has borne it in his own body on the tree. That's why Christ came. He came to suffer and to die and to take our place on the cross of Calvary. And so, therefore, when the floods came, couldn't shake it. The flood of judgment comes, could, could come. It's born on Christ. We don't have to bear it. You know, then there's this next man. He that heareth and doeth not. He's like the man without the foundation. Built a house just upon the top of the soil, just went straight up, didn't do anything unseen, never had a moment in his life when he trusted Christ. The floods came, beat vehemently, immediately his house fell. Immediately. And it says the ruin of his house was great. You know, to the person who doesn't have Christ in their life, the ruin of their house is great. To be in a lost eternity forever and ever and ever. To not, have, to not have Christ. To miss heaven. To miss all hope of being saved from your sin. And to having to go out into a lost eternity without Christ. The ruin of that house was great. Great. You know, I wish I could go into that word great. I wish I comprehended it for myself. The awfulness of a soul to go into all eter to eternity without hope, without the Savior, to go into hell and to the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. What a tragedy, what a loss, especially for someone who was presented with this, the gospel and warned to repent and believe the gospel and to repent or else you'll all perish. That second man, though, he had just as much opportunity as the first man. It says in verse 49, he that heareth and doeth not. The first man, he that heareth and doeth. Just, you know, going out of this gospel meeting tonight. You know, I'll admit, I never like to think of it either, but people would say it, and it's true. You're making a decision by going out the door of this meeting tonight, what you'll do with Christ. You're either like the first man or the second man. Which one will you be like? These things are real. These things are for eternity. The first, you know, to, I was thinking of the security that there is in trusting Christ and the rock. You know, uh, just over in John chapter 10 and verse 28. There's just a verse. You don't have to turn to it. It just says, this is again, words in red of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. To the person who has Christ, to the person who has eternal life, you're so, so secure. You have eternal security. Never perish. That promise of never perishing. No, no one can take, no, not even yourself. You can't even, if you have Christ as your Savior, there's nothing you can do that will make you lose your salvation. You are eternally secure after you have that moment in your life when you trust Christ as your own personal savior. And these are the Lord Jesus' words to prove it. Don't take my word for it. He says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know, you thought about that rock, that, 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 that analogy the Lord Jesus gave, that man that built his life on the rock, who had that moment in his life when he trusted Christ. And you know, how secure he is, we're learning, we're learning here. He's Christ and the man, they're bonded like a rock, inseparable, never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And the floods came and 
the sin, the judgment that we should, we should, we deserved on ourselves. They can't shake us. They can't, can't, can't move us. The Lord Jesus, he bore them all on his tree and we're secure in him. We're attached to the rock. There's nothing inseparable about that. To the man who doesn't have Christ, Christ is here with an outstretched arm. The other man and the floods and the streams came and just immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. So which of these two men will you be like tonight? What, what, will, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with his words? His, his, his preaching that he, the very words that he said when he was here, repent and believe the gospel. Are you going to repent? Are you going to have a time in your life like tonight that you will repent, that you will acknowledge that you have a need of a savior, that you have sins to turn from them and turn to Christ? Believe the good news that he came into the world to save sinners, that he came, that he bore the wrath and judgment of God that we would suffer in all eternity for, that he bore it all in his own body on the tree in Calvary. That's why he came. And what love the Savior has as you read through the Bible, just the warnings he gave, he doesn't want anyone to go there. You know the cost it costs him to purchase a place in heaven for you and me? Cost him his own life. He loved you unto blood. How many people do you know in the world today that would love you unto blood? That when someone has a gun pointed at your head, would step in the way and say, no, shoot me instead of him. The Lord Jesus, he knows that your sins and iniquities, that you'd take them far away from him, that you'd take them to an awful place and hell on the lake of fire for all eternity. And he says, no, I'm going to take the judgment. That's why I came. And he came down out of love and he warned repent and believe the good news that i'm here to take the judgment instead of you repent and believe trust trust in the lord jesus christ tonight do it tonight you might say well it's all good and i agree with it and then i'll make sure to do it i'll make sure to get that foundation in but you know when did that foundation go in for that man right at the beginning you don't build the house and then put the foundation under it you don't build the life and then put the foundation on it People have gotten saved on their deathbed and praise God and thank him for this grace and his mercy and his long suffering with them. But you know, the best time to get that foundation to be built on the rock is right at the beginning, right when you're starting to build your life, right at the beginning of life. Just like that man, just before he built his house, he got what matters settled. You know, before you go chasing the big bank account, before you go chasing the honor and fame of this world, you need to get this settled. And it's not a big process. It's not a big process, but you have to buckle your pride and admit that I need a savior and there's nothing that I can do of myself. So that's our prayer for you that you do it tonight. No guarantee of tomorrow. The old now is the accepted time. The old now is the day of salvation. It's all the Bible guarantees us right now. What are you gonna do with Christ? What are you gonna do with his offer? Repent ye and believe the gospel. I'd like to read, please, from the book of the Acts, please, in chapter number 16. Acts chapter 16. It's a familiar story, so we're just going to break into the middle of it. And verse number... Um, Verse number 27, this is when the earthquake just happened. The keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. He called for a light and sprang in, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And we trust the Lord will bless the reading of the word of God and what you have heard already. It's a familiar story. And I think I spoke on this story several times I've been here. So you're probably wondering, what am I going to take up? I think one of the time I took up, I was here. I think I took up the expression, him awaking out of his sleep. And I think pretty sure there was another time. I'm not expecting you to remember this, but I'm pretty sure another time I got up here 
And I spoke on the two preachers. I told the story from the two preachers. I think that was another kind. So I want to talk to you about the question that he asked. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You ever, um, you know, you, you go to an event or particularly you see it in school, in the class, and the children raise their hand and ask the question to the teacher. And the teacher right away says, that is an excellent question. That's an excellent question. What is an excellent question? Or let me put it in the other way. Like, what is a bad question? Or to put it plainly, what is a stupid question? There is such a thing as a stupid question. It really does exist. Okay, what is it? A, 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 a foolish question, a stupid question is basically a question that a person asks without thinking. Okay, I'm guilty of this. Okay, like I'm in my home. I ask my wife where something is before I even attempted to look for it. We do that. You, you, you ask things without thinking. You, you don't process anything. You, you, just, you just blurt it out. But what is a good question? A good question is someone that had clearly thought about it. They, 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 they process what is happening. And based upon what they understood, they ask the question. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about what this Philippian jailer understood when he asked the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It, it didn't just come out of nowhere. It wasn't just, the, just the, for the moment, and it just, the first thing in his mind. No, no, there was something he understood very clearly when he asked the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So let me just go over what I have here or what he understood. The first thing I want to talk to you about is this. He understood that he needed a spiritual salvation. Let me explain it. Okay. See, if like just moments prior to this, okay, like, like it, it was a huge surprise. It was a humongous surprise. I mean, where he lived, the city of Philippi is like a lot like Vancouver in that it's prone to earthquake. Any moment, like, like they've been, they, they're aware the big one is coming, just like us. Earthquake is coming. It can happen. But never did he imagine that while he was working, while he was on, on site, while he was in the middle of his ship, this earthquake came out of nowhere and he woke up shaken out of his sleep and all of a sudden he could just see that in the middle of the middle of the night and it was dark all he could see was all the prison doors open like i am sure i am positive he must have rubbed his eyes a little bit and think did i see that correctly the prison doors open because you know if one of those prisoners escape he's done he's dead and he must have thought it was an absolute nightmare to see the whole prison doors completely open. Mind you, that was a miracle. That must have been, like, just think about this, folks, for a moment. All the prison doors open, but none of the buildings collapse. Like, like that, that's a miracle. You know what was happening? God sent that earthquake because he wanted to wake this man up. He didn't know that. He took a sword. And he was about to end his own life right then and right there. Because my life is over. People have escaped. And suddenly, here are two men way in the end of the prison. He said, no, no, no. Everything's fine, sir. Everything's fine. Nobody escaped. So he's fine. His life is secure. He is safe. So what's he doing going to these two men and say, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Like, your life is fine, sir. Like, if, if it was somebody else, you know, who heard, well, no, no, all the prisoners, you know, all the, nobody escaped. It was just the prisoners open. Just go back and, you know, secure all the prison doors and everything will be fine and go back to sleep. No, no, he wasn't going to do that. Because this man understood that while his physical life was secure, he had a bigger problem. There was something that is far more important than physical security. It's spiritual security. 
There's something far more than security for this life. He needs a security for the life, next life. What must I do to be saved? There are people that are living in this life and they come to religion, they come to church and they're looking for something for this life. I have marriage problems. I have friend problems. I have all these sorts of relationship problems in my life. And while those are all serious, and while all those are important, and there are things that need to be dealt with, but dear souls in this gospel meeting tonight, I hope you can grip, this can grip you like it gripped this man. He had a problem that exceeded all those other problems. He had a problem that exceeded the fact that he almost died. He said he needed to be saved. He needed a spiritual salvation. But let me come to my second point. There's a second thing he realized. The reason why he needed a spiritual salvation, and the reason why he asked the question, because suddenly that man realized, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to die. He almost died. But you say, sir, did you not think about this? Like, did you not think about the fact that, you know, like he was a soldier? Like, like what, what likely happened was, see, city, the city of Philippi was like a colony. It's a colony. So it's a Roman colony. So what ended up happening is that a lot of these men who were ex-military men who worked for the Roman army, and when they retired out of the army, whatever age they hit, they, 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 they kind of retire in a colony and work in like a prison guard job. Okay? I mean, he was a soldier. A soldier faced death every single day. Every day in the battlefield, that could be his last day. Did you never think about this? Has it never dawned upon you that you could die at any moment? So what happened? It didn't. I, I, I'm pretty sure that morning when this man woke up, he didn't think about anything about getting saved. He didn't think about anything about the fact that he wasn't ready to die. And in came to his prison two strange men that came from the other side of the world, Paul and Silas, Jews from the land of Israel, preaching a message that he has never heard before regarding Jesus and the need to be saved and God's way of salvation and the need for the forgiveness of sin. And it never even bothered him. In fact, he locked them up. He fastened them in stocks. He physically chained them to the walls so they can't escape. It didn't bother him. And it wasn't until the man held the sword to his own throat and he was about to end his own life, he suddenly realized, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to meet God. And I must be saved. Can I ask you tonight, what's it going to take? Like, let, let's get real for a moment if you're not saved in this gospel. I mean, what is it going to take for you to realize that you must be saved? What's it going to take for you to realize I'm not ready to die? I'm not, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not prepared to meet God. I'm in my sins. And I am not ready for the next life. What's it going to take? Accident that brings you to the brink of life and you suddenly realize, I need to be saved. Many of you here sat through a series of gospel meetings. Is that enough to wake you up and make you realize you must be saved? Or does it have to be some worldwide pandemic? Has that woken you up yet to realize that life is fragile? We can die at any moment. And if you die in your sins, you're not ready. What will it take to drive you to your knees like it did to this man? And ask the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Thank the Lord it woke the man up. And he asked the question. I, I think some of you here that were at South Main Street the other night, you hear me tell the story about a um, Mr. Procopio that we had the tent meetings with in Maple Ridge. He stayed with us. He told us about a series of gospel meetings that they had in a place called Lanzalou, Labrador. Okay, I know some of you heard I me mean, tell, tell, tell about that. As far as he was concerned, it was the most number of people he's ever seen saved in a series of gospel meetings. It was 16 weeks, 16 weeks of gospel meetings. 
And it was about 40, 50 people got saved. Actually, what had happened was this. It went on for 16 weeks and they had a break, five weeks, and they came back for another five weeks and another group of people got saved. That was an incredible series. And there was one man that he always talks about who, he was a drunk. His name is Freddie, he's drunk. And Mr. Procopio, Mr. McCandless, the other man that was preaching together in that series of gospel meeting will go visit him because he was a relative of the believers that, that were in the assembly in Lansalut. And he just won't come. He'd been to the Sunday school. He grew up here at the gospel. He will not show up to a gospel meeting. So Mr. McCandless just one day just had it. Okay. And if you, if you know Murray McCandless, you, you can fully appreciate what happened next. Okay. Like Murray McCandless just about had it. You know, he, and he was, he was ready to leave. Mr. McCandless was ready to leave. And, and, and Mr. McCallum said, okay, we're going to pray. And before anybody could even react, Murray McCallum just dropped on his knees. And the only thing that he said was this, oh God, don't let Freddie go to hell. And Mr. McCallum got up and he walked out. And Mr. Procopio was still sitting there. So Freddie looked at Mr. Procopio and said to him, I guess you've been told. Mr. Procopio said, no, 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 Freddie, you, you've been told. The man was not at all interested in getting saved. He was a drunk. He, was, he, had, he didn't want anything to do with the gospel. You know what happened that night? He went to a bar like every other night. Got drunk. And this one night, he got into a bar fight. And one of the fellows that were at the end of the bar pushed Freddie right up against the wall and said, Freddie, go to hell. He woke up and the only thing that he could think about all that night drunk that he was that if i walk home and i don't watch myself and a car hits me on my way home i'm gonna be in hell he woke up and as he was walking home still drunk all the way as he was staggering on he's stumbling and staggering on his way home praying to god that god will spare him he got home and all he could do when he sobered up was he opened his Bible and he read and he read and he read, crying to God, what must I do to be saved? Is that what it's going to take for you? Is it God has to bring in some extra special circumstances because gospel meeting just simply not enough to wake you up? This man realized, I'm not ready and I must be saved. There's something else you notice. What must I do to be saved? There were a lot of people in that prison. Like they, they, they were just the three of them. I know the story makes it sound like they're just three of them. You know, there's the two preachers and then one man. But there was a whole host of people in that prison. He had a family. I, I take it from this passage, he had a wife and children. But that moment, the only person that mattered was this. What must I do to be saved? Can I ask you, is, is salvation personal? Or are you concerned about, oh, well, you know what? I'm okay. My, my siblings aren't saved yet. No, I, 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 no, no. What about you? Ever think about you getting saved? Like, I, I'm, I'm amazed with, like, with people, like, you know, like today, the, the trends today. Like, like, you know, when people take pictures and, and they're at a beautiful scenic site and, you know, like, like, you know, take the mountains and, you know, take the rivers, but, but I got to be in it. Okay, you know, you know, the selfie age, okay? Like, like the, the, it's all about me, okay? Everything's on me. It's the iPhones and the iMac. It's I, me, myself. It's all about you. Oh, but when it comes to God's salvation, it's not about you anymore. Why? Do you ever realize that you're the one that needs to be saved? Do you ever realize you're the one that Christ died for? That he left heaven for to come into this world and to die for you. It was for you. Because it's not until you realize this is personal. You will never get it. That's what I had to come to. I, I, I sat through Sunday school lessons. I've been to a series of gospel meetings. The, the, the series of gospel meetings that I got saved. And it wasn't until I realized that all those verses I memorized that said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God that it actually meant me. You can believe it. I memorized those verses. 
I read those verses. I learned them in Sunday school. And it wasn't until one night it suddenly dawned upon me. Oh, all means me. Yeah. And if it's not personal, you're not going to get saved. But I want you to know there's something else you really like. Not just what must I do? What I do to be saved. What must I do? This man was absolutely determined. What must I do? Not a maybe, not a might. What must I do? You know how you know why I know he meant what he said? Because he fell at the feet of the two prisoners he just locked up, and they said he fell down trembling. And by the way, that didn't happen in the dark. Okay, because he brought a light in. Okay, I, I just want to I, I want you to understand this picture. Okay, when you're the prison guard and you are locked, you have a bunch of prisoners. You, the prison guard, is supposed to be the alpha male. Okay, you're the big boss. Everybody's supposed to be scared of you. Okay, you do not want to look weak. Like, what is he doing? He fell at the feet of two prisoners with all those other prisoners. I don't know if they were awake or not. With all those other prisoners looking on as a big, tough man that just locked them up, trembling in fear. Because it didn't matter to him anymore what people think, what they thought. What must I do to be saved? Can I ask you, how many gospel meetings have you left? And you really want to get saved. You, you really do. Oh, but you, you can't show it. Don't let people know you want to get saved because it makes you look weak. You ever see a thing like that? Oh, no, don't, 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 make, don't make people think you're concerned about getting saved. Don't, don't show on your face the fact you're, you're, you're troubled about the fact that you're not ready to meet God. Don't, don't show it. Just, 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 just laugh it off. Make some jokes. Maybe, maybe have some fun. Sing a song, whatever you do. Just don't make people realize you are concerned about getting saved. This man didn't care. He didn't care if those prisoners thought he was weak. He didn't care if they thought he was a pathetic fool. The only thing that mattered was this. What must I do to be saved? There was a man that was, he came to Victoria Drive 16 years ago for a series of gospel meetings. He's a preacher from Iowa, Mr. Mr. Christopherson. He had a really interesting story. His family had a really interesting story because his father and mother grew up in the assemblies and they never got saved. And they, they, well, I shouldn't say they never got saved. They, they never got saved until their 50s. And to make the things even more strange is that the two of them married each other. You know, they weren't saved. And they came to every meeting. They never missed the meeting. So much. And then, you know, they went to every gospel meetings. And, and all their kids got saved before them. They didn't get saved until their 50s. And one day, the day that after Mr. Christopherson got saved, his father was working with them in the barn in Iowa. And his father said to Mr. Christopherson, said, help, help. You know, he was so glad to hear his son, his son got saved. He said, help, I want to tell you something. I am prepared to cut off this arm of mine and give you this entire farm if I could only have what you have. How bad do you want it? If God's salvation somehow involved you giving up everything, would you do it? Give up your time? Give up your money? Give up your energy? Give up everything? Would you do it? This man was willing to. Because he didn't care. He didn't care if those men answered, give up all your wealth in order for you to be saved. He didn't care if those men said, lose your job in order to get saved. What must I do? Is school more important than getting saved? Is your education, your career, your fun, the things that you enjoy far more important? Because if those things are far more important, you have not come to the point where you say, what must I do to be saved? But I want you to notice something else. Something else, and I need to hurry up with this. Not only does he realize it's a spiritual salvation, not only did he realize I'm not ready, it's not only a must and it's me, but he realized it is now. He did not say, Sirs, what must I do to get saved? 
He's not interested in getting saved, if that's a surprise to you. Not at all. He wants to be saved right at this moment. I must be saved. You want to get saved? Can I ask your plan? What is your plan of getting saved? When? You're waiting for the next series? Next conference? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a friend of yours that's up here preaching. Maybe that's when you get saved. Maybe it's someone relative of yours speaking up here. Maybe that's when you'll get saved. What are you waiting for? And can, can I just be straight with you? If your plan of getting saved is anything other than now, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Last thing. This is going to sound like a really silly point. Okay? It's going to sound like so obvious. He said, no dot. He, he thought about this. But I'm making it anyways. He asked this question. Because he didn't know how to get saved. You got that? He asked the question to these men because he didn't know how to get saved. What you say? No kidding. Of course. That's why you ask questions because you don't know the answer. So let me ask you this. If you're not saved tonight, do you know how to get saved? You say, yeah, of course I do. I memorized this verse. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So why aren't you saved? You know what the re reality is? You don't have a clue how to get saved. That's the reality. You do not have a clue how to get saved. Have you ever asked anyone how to get saved? Like, I, I'm looking at many of you here. You grew up in Christian homes, and I'm pretty sure your parents got saved. You would think maybe they know something about getting saved. Do you ever ask them? Oh, no, no, no. You, you, don't, you don't ask them. No, no, no. You know, you, we, we here in the Sunday school, we here in the gospel meeting, getting saved is so simple, and, and, and anybody can get it. Really? So why aren't you saved? No, no, I, I can figure this out. You're not figuring it out. You're not. You're, you're not getting this. So why not humble yourself and ask someone how to get saved? Why not? Or does it just hurt your pride too much to realize, I do not have the answer. You know how many of us who heard the gospel and we sat through meetings and we think to ourselves, yeah, yeah, I, I got this. I, I know how to get saved. And it wasn't until we realized like this man, I don't have a clue. I don't know the answer. That we cried out to God, help me to get saved. Would you be like this man? And just ask the right question. What a beautiful answer he got. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's him. It's him all along. And the moment you trust him is the moment he will save you. May the Lord bless us for shall we pray. Father, we give thee thanks again.